Well, welcome everybody. This is uh, Dr. Tom Carr, and this is the Lay Dominican Informational Meeting podcast or webinar, or <laughs> I don't know what you want to call it, but this is a recorded version of a live meeting that we held a couple of times here in Ave Maria uh, as a way of introducing our uh, new Lay Dominican chapter to folks who might be interested in joining. So that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to go over what it means to be a lay Dominican, and we'll look specifically at the two unique charisms of the order so that you'll get a good sense, I think, by the time we're done, whether or not you are indeed called to become a lay Dominican. And even if you have a question mark uh, with respect to that, you're perfectly welcome to join us in our meetings on, on a come and see sort of basis. But I think by the time we're done today, you'll have a pretty good idea of what we're about. You'll also certainly know what is entailed in becoming a lay Dominican and whether it is a good fit for you and your time commitments and that sort of thing. So before we get started, let me just introduce myself a little bit. Uh, as I said, I'm Tom Carr. I was a professor of religious studies and philosophy for 17 years. I have a doctorate degree from uh, Oxford University in theology and philosophy and a master's of divinity from Princeton Seminary. I am a convert to the Catholic faith and I've been a lay Dominican for three years now, but I still have a couple of more years to go before I am fully professed. So I'm still uh, on that journey <laughs> toward becoming a full-fledged lay Dominican, but at, by the time you get to the point where I am at, where my wife Ina is at, uh, you can call yourself indeed a lay Dominican. My wife Ina is a uh, homemaker, mother of three, and homeschooler, and she's also very active in the parish here in Ave Maria. Uh, she holds a master's, of, a master's degree in leadership management, and she also has a degree in Bible. <clears throat> and uh, we moved here about, uh, well, as, as of this recording, about five months ago, September 1st, 2021, and we really hit the ground running. We launched this new lay Dominican group a couple of months later with Pastor Vidal's blessing, and he is also, I'm happy to say, serving as our uh, chapter chaplain. So he is our spiritual director, and I will be the formation director and basically president of the chapter until someone else takes my place. And my wife will do just about everything else. <laughs> she does a lot of the admin. Uh, she operates the, the spiritual side of our meetings together by helping us in prayer and in some of the community aspects and a number of other things. So that's a bit of introduction to who we are. Let's go ahead and, and jump in to our presentation today. And I want to begin by the with some prayer, which is the way we begin our chapter meetings always. Uh, and we always pray, in addition to receiving some prayer intentions, we always pray a decade of the rosary together. And we're going to do it together, you and I, in the manner that Dominicans pray it. So it's a little different than your standard rosary. And uh, it's really based on the format of the Divine Office. If you're familiar with the Liturgy of the Hours or the Divine Office, then you'll be familiar probably with some of this format. But let's go ahead and pray together, and then we'll get started with our meeting. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare thy praise. O God, come to my assistance, O Lord, make haste to help me. Glory to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, 
and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay. So we will see in a little bit that the rosary is indeed deeply connected to the origins of the order, to St. Dominic himself, and to the charisms of the, of the order. But we'll get there in a little bit. So let's start with the question... Who are the lay Dominicans? I took a definition, a very nice definition, from the website of the Southern Province of the Lay Dominican Order. And there are four provinces here in the United States, Eastern, Southern, Central, and Western. We are in Florida here. We are in the Southern Province. And from that website, we find the following definition of what it is to be a lay Dominican or who are the lay Dominicans. So the laity of St. Dominic, that's a, another way of saying the lay Dominicans, are those faithful who, baptized in the Catholic Church or received into her, confirmed and in full communion of faith, sacraments, and ecclesiastical governance. And that's kind of a mouthful, but all that's really saying is that you are a baptized and practicing Catholic in agreement with all that the Church teaches. So if, if there are any issues with that, then becoming a lay Dominican is probably not your, your vocation. <laughs> because as lay Dominicans, we are called upon to defend the teachings of the church in all of its aspects, right? Its moral aspects, its spiritual aspects, its doctrinal aspects. And if we're not willing to defend every teaching of the church, then we're not able to live out our Dominican charism. So. That's kind of a crucial um, line in the sand, I guess we could say. And if that's not something that you can affirm right now, then it's probably best if you uh, did not consider becoming a lay Dominican, at least at this point in your life. <clears throat> Secondly, uh, they are called by a special vocation to progress, and I have that word intentionally underlined, to progress in the Christian way of life and to animate temporal things. So the calling here is really the essential part of this part of the definition because to become a lay Dominican means that you are answering a call from God to a very particular vocation. You're not joining a club. You're not joining a confraternity or a something like the Legion of Mary or um, even something like the Knights of Columbus, you are being, you are called into a religious order. As lay Dominicans, we are as much fully Dominican as a friar or a sister. 
And so that's something we really need to take very seriously. It is a calling to a vocation. And of course, that's something we will, I will try to help you discern today. And then you'll take it into prayer. You can pray about it for a while. And again, as I said, you can always come to our meetings to test out that calling a bit to see if it's a good fit for you. But discerning that is really a big, important part of the process. And I want to emphasize here that it is the calling is to progress in the Christian way of life. It is not to be perfect in the Christian way of life. Right. That's a state that will be reserved for us in heaven, God, God willing. But in this lifetime, and as particularly as lay Dominicans, we are called to progress in our Christian spirituality. So I want to emphasize those things. And then lastly, through the charism of St. Dominic. So to become a lay Dominican is to be a practicing, active, faithful Catholic in fidelity to the teachings of the church, who has a calling from God to progress in the Christian way of life through the charism, or we really should say charisms, of St. Dominic. So the next question that naturally arises is, who is St. Dominic, right? So let's learn a little bit about him. So St. Dominic was born in 1170 and died in 1221 at the age of 51. August 6th is his uh, the date of his death, but his feast day was moved a couple days later uh, throughout the centuries uh, to make room for something else. And I'm not exactly what that something else was. He was born in Castile, Spain. So he's a Spaniard and he died in Bologna, Italy. He did not live a large part of his life in Spain, but he certainly started there. There's a nice story told about his birth and it comes down to us from his mother, who is a blessed in the tradition of the church. And while she was pregnant with St. Dominic, she had a dream, and in her dream, she saw that she gave birth to a dog with a torch in his mouth. And this dog ran around the forest, lighting fires wherever he went. She presumed from that dream that her son would be some kind of an evangelist, and that wherever he went, he would preach the gospel, starting fires of revival. And that is actually quite literally what happened with St. Dominic's life. Wherever he went, he made converts to the Catholic faith. There's a nice little play on words here because the word Dominican in Latin, Dominicanes, of course, it comes from Dominic's name, right? It is named after him, but in Latin, Dominicanes is, uh, con is comprised of two words, uh, Domini, which means of the Lord, and Canes, which means dog, or dogs, I guess, plural. And so dogs of the Lord is kind of the nickname, a funny nickname that the Dominicans have as uh, per the dream of his mother. So in, in uh, Spain there, sorry, a little bit ahead of myself there, in Spain, he studied for the priesthood in Castile, six years of classics, four years of theology. He graduated right at the very top of his class. And at graduation, an interesting thing happened. Uh, there was a famine that swept through the area and many people were poor and without enough money for food. Dominic seeing this was moved in his heart to sell all, all of his possessions, including many of his books, which were his prized possessions. And he took the money and he bought food for the poor families that didn't have enough. Now that caught the attention of the local bishop who took Dominic under his wing, brought him into the canons regular. Those are the priests who uh, serve the cathedral and really made him his disciple. This was a very holy bishop, uh, Bishop Diego, Bishop of Osma. And he took Dominic under his wing. He uh, tutored him, discipled him, brought him up in the faith, and eventually made him the uh, the uh, the prior of the canons regular there at the cathedral. So um, Dominic and uh, Saint Dominic and the Bishop Diego decided to go on a mission together. They were actually sent by the Pope for a particular purpose, but they got halfway to their destination, stuck in the south of France. And the purpose that they were being sent to, 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 to do, 
the, the mission that they had been given by the Pope to com com complete uh, fell apart while they were in the south of France. So they decided to stay there for a little while and they discovered that the south of France, it, from town to town, city to city, was swamped by a heresy known as the Albigensian heresy. Now, a little bit about the Albigensians before we go further. Uh, Albigensians are uh, a form or were a form of Gnosticism, the same uh, heresy that St. Paul was wrestling with in a couple of his letters, the same heresy that uh, was shadowing the early church for so many centuries and creating so much trouble. This is sort of a new form of, the Al of that heresy. And the Albigensians teach four things. First of all, they teach that all material things are evil and they come from the devil, that only spiritual things are good and they all come from God. Um, secondly, they practice an extreme form of asceticism. They don't believe in marriage or family. They don't eat any meat. They don't have any possessions. They wear very simple clothes, that sort of thing. Thirdly, they teach that suicide is the most noble form of death, particularly suicide by means of starvation. And that if you commit suicide in that form, you will be freed from the cycles of reincarnation. And that's where the Gnostic part comes in. And fourthly, they denied the incarnation. They denied the divinity of Christ. They denied the ascension of Christ. They denied the presence of Christ in the Eucharist, the virgin birth, on and on and on. A whole series of Christian doctrines they just denied. So clearly they were in a heretical form. But because of their extreme asceticism and their rigorous piety, they won many, many Catholics away from the church and into their heresy, into their, the, their cult, as well as many other pagans joining them as well. So now the Albigensians were some pretty rough guys. So Pope Innocent III, who was Pope at the time, sent a, uh, a messenger to the Albigensians to kind of tell them to knock it off, right? <laughs> stop, stop winning so many converts over to your side and away from the Catholic Church. Well, their response was that they took the messenger, cut him up into pieces and sent him back to the Pope. Pretty tough crowd. So the Pope then sent a holy monk who fared a little bit better, but again, he suffered the same fate. And finally, in, in uh, uh, I'm forgetting exactly the year, but w during the time when Dominic was in the area, the Pope launched a crusade. It was a very bloody battle, lasted over 20 years without a whole lot of success until the very end. So Dominic is here with Holy Bishop Diego in southern France, seeing this horrible problem plaguing the church, the Albigensians, and his whole desire is to stay and preach the gospel to them. So Bishop Diego couldn't do that. He had to return back to his bishopric. So Dominic stayed in the area all by himself, and for 10 years he labored among the Albigensians. I seriously do not know how he escaped death himself, but somehow he did. Obviously, Grace was protecting him. Mother Mary was protecting him. But again, he did not have a whole lot of success. But this reveals two very key things about the unique charism of St. Dominic. First of all, that he had a real heart for lost souls. You know, at the risk of his own life and even struggling through so much lack of success for 10 years, if you can imagine that, all by himself, he stayed and preached to the Albigensians because that was what was in his heart. He saw that they were in a lost place, that they were doomed to hell because of their beliefs and because of their uh, rejection of the truth of the Catholic faith. They were doomed to hell for that reason, and he wanted to rescue them as much as he could. So this, this charism of carrying this burden for lost souls, if that is something that you also possess in whatever degree, a hunger to see souls saved from a world of sin, saved from their bondage to um, evil, then you may very well be called to the Dominican order because that is a huge part of the unique charism of the Dominicans. They have a hunger to see souls saved. Secondly, he had a hatred of heresy and a strong passion to preach the truth, right? 
to sort of show them that they're on the wrong path. They have embraced lies and falsehoods. And the best way to make them aware of that is to share the truth with them. If you have a real passion to see heresies answered, right? If you have a love for apologetics, if you have a love to study the truth so that you can articulate it more clearly, then you may also well have a calling to the Dominicans. If you have both of those things going, and they really work hand in hand, don't they? If you have both of those things in your heart, in whatever degree, you very well may be called <laughs> to become a lay Dominican. Okay, so um, there was a major turning point in Dominic's um, Now, there's a nice story told in this regard where St. Dominic is <clears throat> engaged in a debate with the Albigensians. A large crowd of folks have gathered around. Dominic is on one side of a stage and the Albigensian scholars are on the other side of the stage. And there are a couple of townspeople, judges, I guess, from the town who are called upon to uh, evaluate the, who, who wins the debate. So they go back and forth for a couple of hours, and then the judges are called upon to render their judgment, and they're not able to do so, in part because they have to live with these Albigensians, and they're very afraid if they claim Dominic won the debate, they'll be picked off by the Albigensians. So Dominic has a solution. He says, let's build a big bonfire in the middle of town. I'll take my sacred books you Albigensians take your sacred books. We'll both throw our books on the fire and we'll see which ones burn. Well, according to tradition, both St. Dominic and the Albigensians threw their sacred books onto the fire. Dominic always carried with him, by the way, the letters of St. Paul and the Gospel of St. Matthew. So that's probably what he threw onto the fire. And according to tradition, an angel caught those books up, lifted them above the fire, and they remained unscathed, whereas the Albigensian books fell into the fire and were burned up. So clearly, St. Dominic was declared the winner of the debate. Um, now, there's an old joke, too, that you may have heard before, and this was told to me by Dominicans. So I think I have uh, the, uh, the, the okay to go ahead and tell this joke. So. The Dominican order was founded in order to combat the heresy of Albigensians, and the Jesuit order was founded to combat the heresy of the Reformation. We still have the Reformation with us today, right? Protestants are still active today, but we don't have any Albigensians anymore. So what does that tell you about the Dominicans? All right, moving on. Um, Okay, so back to St. Dominic and the Albigensians. There was a, a major turning point in St. Dominic's engagement with the Albigensians there in the south of France. And it came after these 10 years of very little success. He had managed to win a few souls over to the Catholic cause. And he actually had a few brothers who were with him at that time, who had been one out of the uh, out of the Albigensians, and back to the Catholic faith, and they had kind of committed themselves to him. They weren't yet Dominicans in the formal sense, but they were brothers of Saint Dominic at that point. But he really did not have a whole lot of success, and he was very frustrated by that. So after having fasted for three days, he was in a a state of prayer. He was out in nature, out in the forest somewhere. And he's praying on his knees and he's begging God, you know, God, I give me the grace to win over the hearts of these Albigensians. What can I do to make that happen? And when that prayer was uttered to the heavens, uh, he saw three angels appear in the sky above him. Then the angels disappeared and a great ball of fire appeared in their place. And then the ball of fire dimmed out slowly to blackness, and there in the heavens stood a beautiful woman 
which St. Dominic recognized immediately as the Virgin Mary. Mary told St. Dominic five things and it would turn the course of history. Mary told Dominic to first of all take the string of beads that he was using for prayer and you need to know that in Dominic's day there was a prayer discipline that used a long string of 150 beads and people would pray either the Our Father 150 times or they'd pray Hail Mary or the Glory Be some prayer 150 times on those beads and that would be considered a daily discipline um, and Mary told Dominic, first of all, divide the 150 beads into three groups of 50. Secondly, divide the 50 into five groups of 10. Third, play an out, pray an Our Father at the beginning and a glory be at the end of each of the decade of beads. Fourth, meditate on a mystery of the Gospels before each decade begins, before the Our Father, and then she revealed to him the 15 mysteries of the Holy Rosary, right? The three glorious mysteries, the three sorrowful mysteries, and the three joyful mysteries. And then lastly, and this was the key, she said it to Dominic, I want you to preach to the Albigensians on each of those mysteries pray a decade of the rosary and you will win their hearts. So St. Dominic did that. He saw this as a strategy, right, of winning the Albigensians back to the Catholic faith. And he went out the very next day with his string of 50 beads divided into five sets of 10. And he preached five different sermons, three different times, and he kept doing that, repeating that day after day after day, you know, little sermonettes on the mysteries of the various uh, mysteries of the rosary, followed by the 10 Hail Marys with the Our Father and the glory be at the beginning and the end. And they began converting. They began converting. Something in the power of the rosary and the power of the Hail Marys released them from their falsehood, the grip of falsehood, brought them back to the Catholic faith. So it worked. Um, the, sorry, the, uh, the tide of the crusade turned toward the Catholic faith. The Albigensian numbers started to dwindle over time. More and more people started converting to the Catholic faith. And many of those converts became a Dominicans. So they were the first brothers and eventually brothers and sisters of the order. There's a nice little quote from Father uh, Gar <coughs> Garigou Lagrange, who is a Dominican scholar, probably one of the best Thomas Aquinas scholars in the last 200 years or so. He said this, What the word of the preacher was unable to do, the sweet prayer of the Hail Mary did for hearts. Right? Dominic had preached for 10 years to no effect or little effect, but in one short prayer after three days of fasting, got directions from heaven, a strategy from heaven, and he was able to implement that, and that turned the course of history. So just a little bit about Dominic's death now. Um, in the last decade of his life, he was so caught up in his work, and particularly once the order started in gathering together the materials of the order, getting it approved by the Pope, trips to Rome and back, and all of that. He rarely slept, prayed constantly, never used a bed. He abstained from meat. He fasted routinely. He always chose the worst room in a monastery whenever he visited the rounds of the various priories that he established. And at the age of 51, on August 6th, in 1221, he died of a fever. It might, might well have been uh, from the plague, which was coming and going in those days. His last words to his friars were, and I quote, have charity toward each other, guard your humility, and let your poverty be your treasure. He was canonized by Gregory the Ninth in 1234. That's quite quick, right? 13 years after his death. And as I said, his feast day is on August 8th. Okay, so what is the Dominican order? Well, the Dominican order was formally established 
by Pope Honorarius III in 1216, so that's five years before St. Dominic died. And uh, Dominic chose the name the Order of Preachers as the name for the order. He did not want it to be called the Dominicans, but it came to be known as that after his death. So OP, you'll see the OP initials after both the uh, friars, the brothers who are also uh, consecrated to the three vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, but they chose not to become ordained. Um, the religious sisters, whether they are cloistered or act in active life, and in the lay Dominicans. So if you become a lay Dominican, you can, if you wish to, use OP after your name. We are considered, as I said, as lay Dominicans, full-fledged members of the order. The um, two charisms of the order, sorry, the two charisms of the order, as I said, are to preach the gospel for the salvation of souls and for the defending of the truth, right, against heresy, apostasy, and all forms of false thinking. So those are the two unique charisms. The two mottos of the order are praise, bless, preach, which is a short form of saying praise God, bless the church with your praise, and preach the gospel, preach the truth to anyone who will hear. And then a short form, one word in Latin, veritas, which means truth. The mission statement of the order um, is this, to contemplate to contemplate God, to contemplate scripture, to contemplate truth in various forms, and to share the fruit of that contemplation, which would be through preaching, teaching, writing, or through an active apostolate of some kind. You can't keep it to yourself, right? There are orders where contemplation is really pretty much the end in itself, right? The contemplative orders, and they don't necessarily go out of the monastery to preach. The Dominicans have to go out of their monastery to preach. They have to find some way, including us as lay Dominicans, we have to find some way to share the things that God writes on our hearts when we pray and when we contemplate. The symbol of the order is this. It's a black and white cross with the fleur de lis at the end of each point. <clears throat> black and white triangles in the background signify the Holy Trinity. The black and white can stand for a variety of different binaries in the Catholic tradition, right? Sin and grace, nature and grace, sin and repentance, um, good and evil, uh, God and Satan, right? Um, those sorts of things. And around the outside of the cross on the shield, are the three words in Latin for the motto, praise, laudare, bless, benedicere, and predicere, predicare is to preach. The star up here at the top represents uh, two things. This, the uh, star that Dominic saw in his vision just before Mary appeared and gave him the strategy from heaven for dealing with the Albigensians. And his mother, uh, during Dominic's life, had a dream about the star that Dominic would see in his vision. She had a sort of pre-visionary vision of the vision, <laughs> if we can say that. Okay, so uh, the habit of the order is this. It's a long white tunic with a white uh, scapular that goes down to the knees. And then there is no... Um, well, there's a little bit of a cape or a cowl around the neck, but it's not like the long pointed cowl of the Franciscans or the Capuchins. And when they're preaching or when they are outside in the cold, they wear the black cape on top of that, and hence the name Black Friars. They typically wear a black belt around their waist and a rosary. The rosary can either hang from the side of their belt if it's a smaller rosary. Some of them wear a very large rosary representing the 150 beads of the original rosary that goes around their waist and then dra drags down on the side. <clears throat> so they always carry the rosary with them wherever they go. Uh, St. Catherine and uh, St. Catherine of Siena and um, 
St. Mary Magdalene are the two patron saints of the order. And uh, there are four Dominican popes who are uh, who were raised to that office. Three of them are blessed. There's one saint, St. Pius V. He died in 1572. He's well known or most well known for overseeing the Battle of Lepanto. So another good Marian connection there, right? And the litany of Lepanto. <clears throat> there are over 70 Dominican saints, 48 of whom are martyrs. There are three doctors of the church, uh, one of whom is a woman, St. Catherine of Siena, of course. St. Albert the Great, who was the teacher of St. Thomas and a great Renaissance man of his day. And St. Thomas Aquinas, of course, the greatest theologian of all time. Hands down, no comparison. The only person who might be close would be St. Augustine, but he is a, a, a distant uh, star compared to the son of St. St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, and really, that is, that's just the general consensus whether you're a Dominican or not. Today there are over 6,000 friars around the world, 4,400 of whom are priests, the rest are brothers. In 110 countries there are 24,000 sisters and 70,000 lay members. So if you put all that together, it's about 100,000 Dominicans in the world, 70% of whom are us, the lay Dominican members. So there are more of us than there are of them. That may be one of the reasons why the Dominicans have given us full status in the order. I don't know. But uh, no, we are very, very much considered to be as much a member of the order as the friars themselves. Okay, I want to watch a brief video now, if I can Okay, before we look at this question, who are the lay Dominicans, let me just summarize what we've covered so far. So we've defined what it means to be a lay Dominican. We looked at that. We studied a brief history of St. Dominic's life, and we learned of his twofold unique charism, the hunger to see souls saved, brought to heaven, and a desire to preach the truth against any form of falsehood, especially heresy, apostasy. We looked at the origins of the order itself and a bit about the order at some of its various details and logistical things. Now we need to ask, who are the lay Dominicans? So they started back in Dominic's day in the 1220s, right, just at the last year or so of Dominic's life and then under the direction of his successor, Jordan of Saxony, there was a group of lay people known as the Order of Penitents. Um, not exactly sure why they were called that, but that's what they were called. And they recognized in the Dominicans a charism very unique to their own. So they asked if they could join, uh, not as full friars uh, or ordained in any sense, not taking the vows of poverty and chastity, but they asked if they could join the order as lay people, and it was granted to them. So the lay side of the order was grafted in to the Dominican order itself very early on. The order started in 1216. Five, six, seven years later, there was a group of lay people joining them, participating in their apostolates, praying with them, praying for them, and so on. The, uh, in 1235, there was a group of folks who had survived the Albigensian Crusade, men um, only, known as the Soldiers of Christ. They also recognized the lay Dominicans as uh, carrying a, a charism that they very much valued. They wanted to join. Um, many of them were already married, had families, so they weren't able to become ordained, but they asked if they could join, like the Order of Penitents, as lay members, and it was granted to them as well. In 1255, a group of lay women were added. There were old, already Dominican sisters at this time because St. Dominic wanted to found monasteries of women with the, with the uh, cloistered women who had the primary mission of praying for the brothers 
as they went off on their preaching missions. He recognized the value of intercessory prayer for protection and for success of the mission. And he established that priority by establishing convents of cloistered Dominican women. So there was already the second order in place. In 1255, now we have women joining the lay Dominicans for the first time. The first rule of the lay Dominicans was established in 1285, and the rest is history. There are quite a few famous lay Dominican saints in, in blessings. For among them, the St. Catherine of Siena is probably the most brilliant example <laughs> of the lay Dominican, and really one of the most brilliant examples of any saint in all of history. She is a powerhouse. We will study about her life and some of her writings in as part of our formation process. So if you're a St. Catherine fan, that may be a sign that you are called to become a lay Dominican. St. Rose of Lima, amazing lady as well, lay Dominican. She was well known for only sleeping a couple of hours each night, spent the rest of her time locked up in a room praying. She wore a literal crown of thorns around her head as part of her penance and saw many, many, many conversions and miracles throughout her life. St. Louis de Montfort, de Montfort, if you've done the consecration to Mary through his writings, then you're very familiar, of course, with some of his work and who he is. Now, he is a diocesan priest, and it is perfectly compatible to be a diocesan priest and a lay Dominican. In fact, we're trying to get our, our beloved Father Vidal interested in <laughs> becoming a lay. I don't know if that's going to happen, but look, he has a doctorate in St. Thomas Aquinas from Catholic University, so he's already like halfway there. Uh, St. Martin of Porras, who is an amazing saint, not as well known as some of the others, but he is the Padre Pio of the Dominican order. Amazing miracles. He levitated, he bilocated. There's a wonderful story that is told of his life where uh, a thief runs into the monastery where he's, he's he, he wasn't a monk, he wasn't a friar, but he um, he remained in the lay state all of his life, but he, he swept the floor and he cleaned house for the, for the monks. That was kind of the thing he wanted to do. And uh, so a friar runs into the monastery where he's living and says, please help me, please help me. I'm being chased by the police and I didn't do it. I'm being wrongly accused. So he said, come, let's go pray in front of the altar. And St. Saint, uh, Saint Martin, he sort of reasoned in his head, if this guy's telling the truth, God will protect him. And if he's not telling the truth, God won't protect him and he'll be taken away. So they start praying in front of the altar. The police come into the church looking for anybody and they don't see them, right? They, they completely disappeared. And then the police turned around and went off and never came back. So <laughs> nice, nice story of St. Martin through prayer, protecting an innocent man. Uh, Blessed Bartolo Longo. He is a, an amazing convert to the faith. He was a satanic priest, if you know a little bit about his life. Had a vision of the Blessed Virgin Mary who told him to quit going to seances and quit praying through the tarot cards and to take up a rosary and start praying it because it is the real thing and that other stuff is just false and it's harming his soul. So he obeyed her immediately, took up a rosary, learned how to pray it, and started praying the rosary and he found such peace from doing that and all of this demonic satanic possession that had been causing him so many problems in his life began to fall off him one by one by one and in complete gratitude for that he ended up raising millions of dollars i don't know how many maybe in today's terms um, 50 million 100 million dollars to build a beautiful cathedral in pompeii which is where he where he lived, and it's dedicated now to Our Lady of Pompeii. That's a beautiful story. Blessed Pierre uh, Giorgio Frassati, if you're a younger person, you're probably familiar with him because he's often a favorite of the younger folks, and he is a, an amazing young man. Died at a very early age from polio, but prior to his death, he, he was from a very wealthy, privileged family. His parents were not very religious, but he certainly was. 
He joined the lay Dominicans, spent a lot of time in prayer and especially in adoration. And he would go into his parents' home and take items from them, you know, candlesticks and blankets and clothing and so on, and either sell them and give the money to the poor or give them directly to the poor. And by the time he died, he had won so many friends from the poor that when his funeral procession took place through the city, there were tens of thousands of mostly poor people lining the streets to pay their last respects, much to the chagrin of his parents who had no idea that he was so involved with them in that kind of ministry. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the logistics of the order itself. What are the requirements to become a lay Dominican? There are a few, and some of these are fairly non-negotiable, so let's just go over what is required of you, what's expected of you when you become a lay Dominican. So first of all, as far as requirements go, you do have to be, as I said before, a baptized practicing Catholic of at least one year. So if you're a convert like I am, it doesn't mean that you you don't have to be baptized in the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church, of course, recognizes all forms of legitimate Trinitarian baptism. Um, but you do need to have been a practicing Catholic for at least one year. So you had your first communion and your confession at least one year ago. You do need to be 18 years of age. Um, and that's the point that you start your formation process. So if you're 17 and a half, you'll have to wait six months. You cannot be a member, I'm sorry, I don't have this in the PowerPoint, but you cannot be a member of any other third order. Uh, you certainly can be a member of the lay, um, sorry, the Legion of Mary or some of the confraternities or even the Knights of Columbus, but you cannot be a lay Franciscan or a lay Cistercian, anything like that. Thirdly, you have to be willing to live by the lay Dominican rule. And we'll talk a little bit about that. It's something that we will study as part of our formation process. And there's really not a whole lot to it, but we'll talk about that, about the practicalities of that here in just a moment. You do have to um, submit an application with three letters of reference. I don't have that here in the PowerPoint. And you lastly, you have to feel that you are called to the order. It has to be a sense of real vocation, vocation to the order. Um, and by the way, the application coming in to us is a very simple form, just asking you a little bit about your religious background and some of your education, things like that. And that needs to come in sometime within the first three months of starting your formation process. And then there are three letters of reference that are asked, usually by a pastor or someone from the church that would know you. If that's a problem, and it sometimes is a problem for people that have moved around quite a bit, haven't really connected with their pastor or anybody in the church, then we'll talk about ways of substituting a letter. I just wanna make sure that you're not a member of the Masons or, uh, you know, <laughs> a Wicca, Wicca person, you know, in your spare time, those kinds of things. So, you know, it's fairly much of a formality, but we just want to get a feeling for who you are as you come into the order. Now, that last one, feeling called to the order. We talked about the two unique charisms of the, uh, of the, um, of St. Dominic, and that's very much a part of what it means to be called to the order. So how do I know if I am called to the order? Well, you'll know that you're called to become a lay Dominican if you find yourself drawn to, to three different things. Three different things. We talked about the two unique charisms of the order. So one of them, of course, is to see souls saved. If you find yourself frequently praying, maybe for your children, right, who have wandered away from the faith or maybe never grasped the faith at all, if you find yourself longing to see them come into the church, to see them come to Christ, to see them give their hearts up to God, then you definitely have that as part of your vocation in life. Part of your vocation in the life is to pray for those who are lost and to do whatever you can to help them find the Lord, right? If that's something that motivates you, 
then that's a big part. That's a very big part of what it means to be a Dominican. And so that is a good sign. <laughs> that's a very good sign that you are called to be a Dominican. Um, secondly, you have a real concern for problems in the culture and especially in the age that we're living in now, problems in the church itself. Let's be fully honest here. We're living in an age where the church is in crisis. For the last 50 years, it has been losing members right and left. Vocations are down. Religious orders are folding or getting smaller, mostly. I'm happy to say the Dominicans are not. They're one of the few orders that has kept steady, and if you look at it over 50 years, has grown. But many of the other orders are having problems, right? Churches are closing down. Seminaries are closing down because there just aren't any vocations to support them. And that's a crisis. That's a major crisis. It's a crisis of faith. And to some degree, it is a crisis of the truth. Because very often the truth is not being preached the way it should be from the pulpit. Uh, it's not being described accurately or in a clear fashion in various documents that would otherwise be great resources of formation for the church. Instead, we get quite a bit that's confusing, right? Or ambiguous, or even verging on some problematic statements. So uh, that's, that's a real problem. And if that's a concern to you, if you are concerned about that and there's you, you want to do something about it, then you definitely have a calling to um, this part of the lay Dominican charism because that's a big part of what we do. We train ourselves in the truth through our formation process and it's a five-year formation process so that we can defend the truth, articulate the truth, help others find the truth, and then be saved by the truth, right? So there obviously is a lot that's wrong with the culture around us as well. We've got a great deal of confusion, a great deal of error, a great deal of violations of the laws of nature, to say the least. And if that's something that's concerning to you, and if you want to have tools at your fingertips to uh, combat that sort of thing and to help others combat it, then again, you may well have a calling to the lay Dominicans. Thirdly, you, you desire to live by the four main elements of the lay Dominican rule. Now we'll talk about these here in just a minute, but let me just say in general that the lay Dominican rule, if you become a lay Dominican, the way lay Dominicans live their lives is understood to be the way that God will save your soul. When you become a lay Dominican and you commit yourself to being formed by the various elements of the of the rule, we'll talk about these again in just a moment, then you are really saying to God, this is how I want you to save me, to save my soul, and to bring me to heaven. I want to go to heaven on this path. This is the path that I believe you have chosen for me. So we better understand what those four elements are. Let's talk about those. First of all, prayer. We'll look at each one of these one by one, study, community, and apostolate. These are called the four pillars of the Dominican or order, and they are universal for the friars, for the brothers, for the cloistered nuns, for the active sisters, and for all of us as lay Dominicans. They're the very same things all throughout the order. So let's first talk about uh, prayer. So in the Dominican order, prayer is not just for itself alone. It's not an end in and of itself as much as that is a valuable thing. In the Dominican charism, prayer is always with a purpose. The purpose is to see souls saved. So a great deal of our prayer, in including our own, I should say, <laughs> So when we're praying as Dominicans in whatever form of prayer we take up, 
our primary purpose is, is salvation. Salvation of my own soul through my prayer. Salvation of those whom I am praying for. Now let's talk a little bit about how the forms of prayer are unique to the to the lay Dominicans. So all lay Dominicans commit themselves, and this is not something you're committed to from day one, right? This is going to be something that you will learn over time, you'll get adjusted to over time, um, you'll start to implement these things slowly, gradually over time. But all lay Dominicans eventually, by the time you are fully professed, you will certainly be adept at this. We pray the daily office. Not the full daily office, not the seven hours of it, but the two hinge hours, as they're called, lauds in the morning and vespers in the evening. Typically, lauds is prayed around sunrise and vespers around sunset, but the hours in themselves are negotiable right, on a day-to-day -day basis because of our own unique commitments as lay people. We can't always pray when we want to, but generally speaking, then the divine office, the two hours of the divine office will be prayed. Today, it's very easy to do this, right? You can download an app. You can download either the modern version, the reform of the Divine Office after Vatican II. The Divine Office was reformed to some degree, like the Mass itself. You can download that, and it will give you everything in exact order on the date that is required at the exact hour that you're praying, the, the prayers for the Divine Office for that particular hour, lauds or vespers. And it will tell you the pre preliminary prayers and then the opening prayer and then the prayers themselves and then the recitation of the psalms and the prayers that go with the psalms and so on and so on and so on. You can also download what I what I use, which is the 1962 version, the pre-reformed version, which gives you the kind of the original version of the or a divine office. And that is given to you in both Latin and English. You can use either one. So that's also a nice resource. Now, there is a substitute for prayer, and it's something that I use myself quite a bit. I like to read scripture, and I like to uh, practice Lectio Divina. So you can pray through the scriptures for 15 to 30 minutes a day, which would cover pretty much the same time as the Divine Office. Or you can pray the two uh, hours of the Divine Office, which takes, again, together about 15 to 30 minutes. Or you can do a bit of both, right? You can pray the lauds in the morning and scripture in the evening or scripture in the morning and vespers in the evening or pray one week the divine office and the next week do scripture. I, I really enjoy scripture. I love scripture. And my wife can tell me, she knows when I haven't been reading scripture enough. <laughs> she, she, I get a little bit anxious. I get a little bit uh, frustrated with life. And so she's always directing me back to the back to the Bible. So that, again, that's that's an optional thing, but uh, some form of prayer in the morning, usually the divine office or Lectio Divina or some combination of the two. Secondly, we have to practice 15 minutes a day of mental prayer. And most Dominicans, because of our love for the rosary and our love for the Blessed Virgin, we pray the rosary as that. The rosary is a great form of contemplative mental prayer. So divine office is a recited prayer, right? You speak it out loud. The mental prayer is prayer that you are more silent about, but still the rosary satisfies that quite nicely because we're so familiar with the Hail Mary that we get about three or four beads into it and suddenly we're off in the mystical land of contemplation, right? Even though our mouth is moving and there might be some sound coming out, we're off in the level of contemplative meditation on whatever the mystery is, whatever is going on in our life that we need God to help us focus on, that kind of thing. So 15 minutes of mental prayer, typically the rosary or something else. Mass, thirdly, mass as often as possible. Mass, of course, is the greatest prayer of the church. It's the most important prayer that we will experience each day. So uh, certainly every Sunday, of course, every feast day, but as often as you can get to daily prayer, uh, daily mass is strongly suggested. As Dominicans, of course, we hunger for the daily Eucharist. It's our daily food. It's our manna. And it is the essential viaticum, right? The, the bread that we need, the uh, nutrients that we need to live out our daily lives. Especially as Dominicans, we need that strength. We're going to be 
preaching the gospel. We are going to be fighting heresy. We're going to be winning souls for Christ. And for that, we need the body and blood of Christ. So as often as we can get to daily mass, the, the better. And then finally, confession at least once a month. Right? Monthly confession is strongly recommended as lay Dominicans. We want to keep a short account of ourselves, of our sins, of our venial sins, mortal sins, of course. Uh, as soon as they're committed, we ought to go to confession right away to clean off that slate and get a fresh start on things. And so monthly confession typically is what most Dominicans do. So that covers prayer, right? Those are the four things that we all as Dominicans will strive to incorporate into our lives. And as I'm, as I said before, you don't, you're, you're not expected to be proficient at all of those from day one, but it will be a process of formation over time as you incorporate those things more and more and they will become habits, right? Virtuous habits that create virtue in your life, theological and otherwise. All right, second study, uh, study, and we'll be studying a variety of things together. Uh, we'll study the history of the order. We'll study some theological reflection on these four elements of the rule, prayer, study, community, apostolate. We'll study some of the writings of Thomas Aquinas. We'll study some of the writings of the early Dominicans. Um, we'll study, uh, we don't have any writings, unfortunately, from St. Benedict, uh, St. Uh, Dominic himself, but we do have writings from his immediate predecessors. So we'll read some of those. We'll read St. Catherine of Siena. And we may read some writings of some other folks as well. I mean, there are some famous Dominican theologians throughout the centuries after Thomas Aquinas who uh, wrote some beautiful things, beautiful reflections. But we also might read something like um, a, a, a a writing from Benedict the Sixteenth, or maybe John Paul II, something like that, that might support some of our uh, some of the rule that we're trying to live out. Okay, so that's study, and we will do that together as a community. So when we come to the meeting, I'll go over the format of the meeting here in just a minute. But we'll, we'll we will spend time as a group in formation, where we will study some of these preliminary things and form formative things. And then <clears throat> we will also study most likely the writings of a Dominican uh, together as a, as a full chapter. So if you're in a formation process, if you're early on in your journey toward becoming a lay Dominican, then you need to attend that first part of the meeting where we do our formation. But once you get further along, you won't be attending that, but you will be attending the full part of the chapter where we will be studying something else in addition, something a little deeper, perhaps a little richer, a little more challenging. Okay, so uh, next step is community. Now, um, your requirement for community is satisfied by coming to the monthly meeting. That's really the the only full requirement. As a new lay Dominican, in, in your first stages of becoming formed as a lay Dominican, then you will be required to attend the full meeting. It's about four hours. We meet on the second Saturday of each month. We do meet uh, in Donahue School for now. And if there's any change on that, we will email you. We're up on the second floor down at the end of the hall. And uh, our typical monthly meeting looks something like this. It will always start after prayer. It will start with about 45 minutes of our formation meeting and you will have assigned readings that will be given to you ahead of time. You read through those, maybe take a few notes, ask some questions, and then together we will discuss the readings. I'll kind of go over them. I'll do a little bit of teaching on them. I'll throw out some questions. We'll get talking about what it is you're learning. So that's our formation, the formation part of the meeting. Um, after that, then we will uh, have some lunch together, and we thought we would be able to do some potluck but there isn't really a facility for that right now. So we're just bringing sack lunches and whatever we want to drink. So we sit around and we, we share a little bit about what's going on in our lives with each other. And so we know how to pray for each other, that sort of thing, and while we're eating our lunch. After the lunch, then we'll take up specific prayer intentions and we'll have some time of prayer together, just usually a decade of the rosary as we did at the beginning today. 
we'll go over any chapter business, any logistical things, pr protocol things that we might need to discuss as a group, as a chapter. Then we will launch into our communal study. Right now we're studying a book by a, lay, by a Dominican, Dominican friar, and it's a history of Catholic spirituality, and it is amazing stuff. We just got started, so you can join us at any time. And if you're listening to this, uh, you know, a later at a later time in the year or a couple of years after it was recorded, then again, you're very welcome to join us at any time. It is the sort of cycle that will just repeat itself every year, so you can step into it wherever. And each unit is an independent unit. You won't be, you won't feel left out or feeling like you don't know what's going on because you can just step right in and you'll just complete the full 12 unit cycle over the period of a year and then you can move on to the next level. So we have that communal study and then finally we end up our day by praying the Vespers of the daily office together and that's our meeting. It takes about three and a half to four hours all together to cover that. Um, outside of the, that required community meeting and, and again, if you're not able to attend any meeting, I ended up myself missing a few meetings because of very bad sickness. And we also had problems, of course, during COVID when we were in our lay Dominican chapter up in Washington, D.C. And there are always ways of making up for that. So just need to work with us. Let us know ahead of time if you can, if you had to go out of town or whatever then just let us know and we'll make sure that you have a way of making up for that missed meeting. Uh, we also will have times where we can meet outside of the regular meeting, maybe a social event uh, once or twice a year. We might, like we had a Christmas party at our house, uh, we might have a summer barbecue, um, swim party uh, over at our place, that sort of thing. Or we might attend an event on the campus, you know, a lecture, for example, that has something to do with a Dominican theme. And there are plenty of those all throughout the year. We might all go to a Shakespeare play at the Shakespeare Theater on campus or to the parish, um, a, a parish event of some kind and we'll, we'll attend as a group informally, of course, N nothing of, like that is required, but just as a way of building community over time. Lastly, apostolate. So apostolate here, of course, ministry of some kind is required, but it is very broadly understood. And once again, this is something that you can work your way into over time once you kind of get better adapted and better formed with the Dominican charism. Again, pro some folks are in a profession that requires ministry. You might work for the church, for example, or you are um, teaching a course at the university that is in theology or even philosophy and you're, you know, you're teaching the truth right in your classroom to hungry undergraduates. So that's an apostolate. That's already an apostolate. We might even consider if you're in a nursing profession or a medical profession that you are forming an apostolate, but that there you would have to do something a bit sort of over and above the duty, for example, you might ask your patients that you're caring for if you can pray for them. Uh, you might leave them with a little pamphlet or pray a decade of the rosary with them or invite them to um, to mass, something like that. So you're kind of, you know, you're, you're being a bit more evangelical than you might normally be in your profession. But again, that would be an apostolate. Um, working for the uh, or, or volunteering for the pro-life group here on campus or joining the Legion of Mary, or serving as a lector, or an usher in the church. Those are all apostolates. So there are a variety of different ways. We will also have a community or group apostolate that we can all do together. We're looking at perhaps going into a makale and joining another group that's already there once a month to feed the poor and to preach and to pray for people. So that's something that we can all do. And if you did that regularly, then that could be your apostolate. But it would also be nice, I think, if we did that together as a group, as just a group formation, community formation thing. So um, some people have a podcast. Some people write a book or write a blog. Uh, some people set up a YouTube channel or a website that's devoted to some aspect of Catholic life. These are also 
all apostolates because you're getting the truth out there. You are preaching, proclaiming, defending the truth. Okay, last thing that we're going to talk about and then I will let you go. The benefits, the good stuff to becoming lay Dominican. So, <clears throat> uh, here are eight benefits and there are more than these, but I uh, just wanted to highlight at least eight of the key benefits to becoming a lay Dominican. First of all, you as a lay Dominican will have St. Dominic as your father. Of course, your father in heaven is God, <laughs> of course. You also have an earthly father that you're called through the Ten Commandments to honor and respect. But St. Dominic becomes a kind of spiritual father to you. He takes you under his wing. He cares for your spiritual development. He prays that graces will fill your life in a unique way so that you can live out your Dominican charism. And once you are in heaven, not only will you be greeted by this amazing saint, but you'll also be greeted by all the Dominican saints, every Dominican lay, friar, sister, and otherwise, who is in heaven at that point, the time of your death, will all come out and greet you as a member of the family. So that's, that's a nice thing to think about. You, secondly, share in all the merits of the prayers, the penance, the good works of every Dominican around the world throughout all of history. We're well, going back to the beginning of the order, at least, 1216. So every act of penance, every time that Dominic flagellated himself, which I guess he did um, daily, every act of fasting, every act of self-abnegation are all creating merits that go into a Dominican treasury of merit from which me, we may draw when we are in need of grace. So my goodness, that in and of itself is quite a benefit. I think we all would agree. Um, there are 10 unique opportunities as Dominicans that are not available to anybody outside of the order to earn a plenary indulgence. You get a plenary indulgence on your entry into the order, and that's on day one, right? That's not at the end of five years, that's on day one. Then at the end of five years, and it is a five-year formation process, there are three levels, you don't need to worry about those. The first level is one year long, the second year level is one year long, and the third level is three years long. But on entry into the order, at the full profession, at the end of the two years, I'm sorry, at the end of the five years, and then at your death, plus seven other unique times that you get to earn a plenary indulgence that no one else gets to earn because they're not Dominicans. Uh, you enjoy the society of Catholics all around the world, but particularly here in Ave Maria, who are devout and very serious about their faith. I have to say, we, we've been a part of uh, a chapter, a large chapter up in the Dominican House of Studies in Washington, D.C. And with the 20 to 30 people who are already interested in becoming lay Dominicans here in Ave Maria, we have to say, my wife and I would agree, that amazing people are drawn to this order. Some really amazing people. And having met uh, quite a few friars, some of whom have come through Ave Maria here to give a paper or to make presentation, some of the friars we met in, um, in Washington, D.C., some of the friars we met in Medjugorje on a recent trip there, friars we know in Rome, they are all high-quality, devout, faithful, loving, in many cases very kind and nice to be around Dominican people. They are very, very good Catholics, right? very devout in their faith. It really attracts folks who are very serious about their faith and very eager and hungry to grow in their spiritual life. So it is, it's not an elite order by any means, but it is an amazing group of humble, faithful Catholics. And I think we, that's a credit to St. Dominic, right? That's who he was. He was an amazing, humble man, devoted not to anything of his own ambition, but only to seeing souls saved and the truth defended. 
Uh, next, uh, you get to be buried if you want in the full Dominican habit. You can wear the scapular and the cape and the belt and the rosary and the whole garb if you want. Now, I, I think if you're a man, you're wearing the friar's habit. And if you're a woman, you're wearing the sister's habit. I could be wrong about that. I don't know. My wife is arguing a little bit with me about that, but she wants to be buried in the friar's habit. Um, but we'll have to find out about that. But in any case, you will have that as an option of some sort or another. And the chapter will attend your funeral, and we are, in fact, required to attend your funeral. One of our commitments as part of the rule is that we will pray for every deceased member of our group. We haven't had any deceased yet, so we don't, really, we don't have anyone to pray for just yet. <laughs> Thanks be to God. But when we do, and obviously we eventually will, uh, that person will have the benefit of the prayers of every member of the chapter. And at your funeral, you will have many members of the order. Now, some, of course, can't attend for various reasons, but it, the requirement is nevertheless there. And that is, you know, something to kind of give some comfort to, because sometimes we get to the end of life and we're not quite sure who is going to come, right? Maybe we're a bit disenfranchised from folks or just because other members of our family and friends have passed on already uh, it might feel a bit lonely but our chapter is always replenishing itself lots of young people especially now that we're next to a university lots of young people coming and they will be more than willing to come and stand witness to your life after it has passed in purgatory, and if you are in purgatory, you will benefit from all Dominican masses and prayers. There's something unique in the Dominican rule that states that every Dominican mass, every mass that's said by a Dominican, the merits of that mass, the benefits of that mass will be applied to those Dominicans who have passed on and who are still in purgatory. And as part of our uh, rule of prayer in the divine office we will also be praying for those in purgatory particularly for those who are dominican so if that whets your appetite then um then there's still more <laughs> there's one last one here so when in heaven after your time in purgatory if there is uh, that required then you will enjoy a special relationship with all Dominicans of all time. Just imagine that, right? So you are able to have long conversation theologically with Thomas Aquinas. You're able to ask Catherine of Siena, how did she do all those crazy things? You're able to talk to Martin de Porras and say, tell me what it was like to levitate when you were in your body. You know, things like that. How, how cool would that be? It would be a great party up in heaven. Okay, last thing to mention here. And that is this, this question. What does it really mean to be a lay Dominican? What is the end game? What is the end game here? What, what is it really all about? Well, before we get there, let me just summarize where we have come from, right? We, we asked the question, how do I know if I'm called to be a lay Dominican? And we said that it was involving three things, a concern to see the soul saved, a concern to help fight heresy and apostasy, to defend the truth in some way, right, with our life. And thirdly, to live by the rule, the four elements of prayer, study, community, and, and apostolate. We went over each of those and described in more detail what those entail. So now we need to ask the question, and we looked at the benefits too, right, of what it means to be a lay Dominican. Now, what is the end game? What is it all about? Let me just summarize very quickly this, the answer to this question. At least this would be my answer. And it's not my answer, I should say. It was the answer that I heard from another Dominican, a Dominican friar who has been in the, in the order for some time, so he should know. He said, and I'm very loosely quoting him, when you become a Dominican of whatever sort, right? friar, brother, cloistered, nun, active sister or lay, when you become a Dominican of any kind, you are saying to God with that commitment, this is how I want to be saved. 
I want to be saved by the lay Dominican rule. I want you, God, to judge me, to judge my life on how well or how poorly I lived by that rule. How much did I attend to my study? How frequently did I develop that habit of prayer? How, how did my apostolate go, right? We are judged by what we did in our body during our time on earth. If you're not in a Dominican order, then you don't have a, a, a plan for that. You don't have a blueprint. You don't have a map to get you from here to there. As a lay Dominican, we have a huge advantage. We have a map. We have a compass. We have structure in our lives that will mark out a path that we can safely walk from now until our death. And we're saying to God, that's the path I want to walk on because I believe I will save my soul. You will save my soul by your grace and through my faithful commitment to this order. So that's the end game. That's really the end game. That's really what it's all about in terms of you as an individual, and me as an individual. We are each saying to God, this is how I want to be saved. This is how I want to be judged. Okay, with that, with that, I better let you go. But I want to finish by just reminding you of a favorite quote from St. Catherine of Siena, one which Father Vidal is also uh, fond of and frequently uses in his sermons, his homilies. St. Catherine said, Be whom God wants you to be, and you will set the world on fire. If God wants you to be a lay Dominican, and as I said, there are three ways you can tell that. If God wants you to be a lay Dominican, by becoming a lay Dominican, you will set the world on fire. Okay, last thing. I know I kept saying this is the last thing. Well, this is actually the last thing. <laughs> I want to pray this prayer with you from St. Thomas Aquinas. And it is a prayer of the discernment of vocation. And I'm going to suggest this to you here. Please pray for guidance from God as to whether or not he is calling you to Dominican spirituality. The goal is to save your soul. So if you pray... He will put you in the right place to accomplish that end. Remain docile to the Holy Spirit and listen to God. And here is the prayer. Let's pray this together. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grant me, O Lord, my God, a mind to know you, a heart to seek you, wisdom to find you, conduct pleasing to you, faithful perseverance in waiting for you, and a hope of finally embracing you. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God bless everybody. If you have any questions, please email me or my wife, Ina, Ina Carr. I'm Tom Carr. You can find us in the parish, most masses, most daily masses. And just grab us after mass and ask your questions. But by all means, come to one of our meetings. Do the uh, come and see approach. You're welcome to come to one or more meetings until you feel the time is right for you to launch into a vocation as a lay Dominican. God bless you. God bless your family. God bless your discernment process. Bye now.